सहनावतु सहनो घुनक्तु सहवीर्यं करवावहै तेजस्विनावधीतमस्तुमा विद्विषावहै ओम शान्ति 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 ओम पूर्णमदः पूर्णमिदं पूर्णात् पूर्णमुदच्छदे पूर्णस्य पूर्णमादा य पूर्णमेवावशिष्यदे ओम शान्ति 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 श्रुति स्मृति पुराणानाम आलयं करुणालयं नमामि भगवत्पादं शंकरं लोकशंकरं शंकरं शंकराचार्यं केशवं बादरायणं सूत्रभाष्यकृतौ वन्दे भगवन्तौ पुनः पुनः ईश्वरो गुरुरात्मेति मूर्तिभेद विभागिने व्योमवद्व्याप्त देहाय दक्षिणामूर्त नम सर्वत्र समदर्शन द वन हु सीज द सेम एवरीवेयर इन एवरीथिंग सो फॉर दैट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी हू सी द सेम इन अवर सेल्स हाउ द सेल इज ऑलवेज द सेम unchanging and something will be unchanged only when it is unaffected by anything else because when there are two factors of the same degree of reality then one affects the other in one way or the other one influences the other so when there are two each one of them is going to be affected by the other and both of them will be changing like there is this mountain and there is rain other than mountain the wind other than mountain the wind the rain they keep on affecting the mountain which wears wears out the mountain then also affects the, the wind each one affects the other so when there are two each one is bound to be changing when we say the self does not change which means that it is one non dual the chitti that i am the consciousness that i am is one non dual i was from used to lead this process in a very nice way he says that is no one like me he does not says i am the only subject everything else is the object I am the subject. Everything else is object. How can you say that, Swami? I am the subject, and that you are the object. So, how many subjects are there? How many objects are there? As many living beings are there, as many atmas are there, the chitti is there, consciousness is there, subjects are there. Is it not so? That's what other people say. Our Sankhya say that, Nayaika say that. We say all of the other schools of thought say that Atmas are many, and some they say they change varied also. But here, how many subjects are there? You can say that you are the subject, and I am the object. I'll accept which I is object. 
What can you objectify? Adrishto drashta, we just said. And the unseen seer. Unseen meaning that the one that can never be objectified. So when you say that you are the subject and I am the object, which aspect of I is the object? This body is what you see. The body is the object. You, the consciousness is subject. My body, and you might infer the state of my mind, that is object. It's the consciousness that is always the subject. There's no one like me. I'm the only subject. Everything else is object. The next question is asked, what is the boundary that divides the subject and the object? What's the boundary that separates the druk from drishya, the drishta from drishya, from the subject from the object, the eliminator from the limit? What's the boundary that separates the two? So in the body is the boundary. The body also is known, is also objectified, that also is seen. Meaning that the subject, the consciousness is where the body is. Wherever you think is a boundary, this hall is a boundary, but then the boundary also is eliminated by the subject. Meaning that the subject is where the boundary also is. I live in the stars which means the subject, the consciousness, is where the stars also are. So what is the line that separates the subject from the object? Or the object from the subject, let us say. Even that separating line also is objectified. And therefore, there is nothing that is apart from subject. The object is not apart from subject. Understand that. Because the object is eliminated by the subject. And the, the light always pervades what is eliminated. Like the light in this hall. Eliminates all these objects, the tables and chairs and so forth. And it pervades where the table and where the illumined is. It pervades what is illumined. Meaning that the illumined is never apart from the illuminator. The object is never apart from the subject. The object is unconscious. The subject is conscious. The unconscious is never apart from the conscious. You may say, Swamiji, how do you say the object is unconscious? I see conscious beings. I see sentient and insentient beings. As I said earlier, we think that we are witnessing consciousness. In, in, a, in a sentient being also, what we witness or objectify is only the objectifier. It is a body. That's all we can objectify. So object is never apart from subject because had object been apart from subject, had the element be apart from illuminator, it could not be illumined. If this table was apart from the light, the table could not be illumined, could not shine. So what is illumined is never apart from the illuminator. The drishya the object we said earlier is illumined by the subject. The colors and forms are illumined by the eyes. The eyes are illumined by the mind. The mind is illumined by the consciousness. What is illumined is never apart from the illuminator. So what we call the whole universe, the drishyam, 
the object is never apart from the subject. Meaning that it does not enjoy an existence independent of the subject. The drishya, the object, is not apart from subject, meaning that it does not enjoy an existence independent of the subject. The object is illumined by a subject. Therefore, the object does not possess an illumination that is independent of the illumination of the subject. So we come to another very important thing. The subject, the drishta, imparts the existence to the drishya. And drishta also imparts the shining to the drishya. Satta and Sphurti. The object exists because the subject is. The object shines because the subject shines. This will become clear when we go, when we examine the experience of dream. We know that dream is a projection, doesn't exist by itself. Dream is illumined by the dreamer. Dream exists because of the dreamer. When the dreamer wakes up, there is no dream world. And therefore, the subject is independent of the object, the object is never independent of the subject. The subject is apart from the object, the object is never apart from the subject. There's no one like me. I'm the only subject. I'm the only eliminator. At the same time, when I realize that what is eliminated is never apart from eliminator, what is eliminated is never apart from me, there's nothing other than me. If what is element exists because of illuminator, if what is element shines because of the illuminator, in Satta and the Sphurti, the existence and manifestation that the element, the objects the world has, is imparted by the very subject. Never, the object is never apart from subject. The object does not exclude the subject. The object is included in the subject. It's very significant. When I realize the true nature of myself, that is the chitti, the consciousness, the witness, the subject, the eliminator, I realize that what is eliminated, the whole universe also is not apart from the eliminator, is included in the eliminator. There is no line that separates the eliminator from the eliminator. There is no line that separates the object from the subject. Means subject includes all the objects. The eliminator includes all the eliminated. There is nothing apart from me. That means that I don't lack. There is no lack or want in me because everything is included. When you lump the object and subject together, when you lump this body mind sense complex with the chitti consciousness self, then I feel a sense of confinement, the sense of insignificance, and everything outside the body is excluded by me, and I am excluded by that. So, a sense of exclusion, we discussed this earlier. A sense of separatedness, sense of being excluded. It is not because it's a real, it is because that I brand myself as a lacking, wanting being. I brand myself as the one that is confined to this body, mind, sense complex. That's how I brand myself and injure myself. And that's how I exclude everything else and then feel lacking, wanting, limited, insignificant. It's a feeling, not a reality about me. 
Because as you say, when I examine the nature of the self, I realize that there is nothing apart from me. The I impart the satta existence, everything. It's I because of which everything shines. But when I say I, everything that exists is included. When the I shines, everything is included. The chitti, the consciousness, the I includes everything. It's all inclusive, very important. Who am I? All inclusive. When? When I do not judge myself based on this body, mind, sense complex, because it is in the category of drishya, object. What's the nature of subject? I'm just a subject. If that is so, then all the objects are included. Everything included in me. I am boundless. With all the boundaries are also in living, I am boundless. There is nothing apart from me that can, that can affect me, that can limit me. I am limitless. So boundless, limitless, consciousness, all inclusive I am. In which there is no lack, there is no want. And there is no scope for desire. Desire has a place or desire has an occasion when there is a lack or want. Desire usually is a manifestation of a lack or want. Or a need. There is no lack. There is no want. There is no need in I. There is no one like me. There is no one other than me. I am one without a second. For example, the goal is that which imparts existence to this ornament like chain, bangle, things. So then when you count gold, to remind you of the story of Puja Swamiji, when a jeweler offered Swamiji, Swamiji, please take one. He took Swamiji to his storeroom where hundreds and thousands of ornaments were all stored there. He switched on the light and they all were glittering. And very proudly he shows them to Swamiji, Swamiji, please take one. Swamiji says, please give me gold. And that person did not get the sense of this. So he take one. Give me gold. Banger. Here is family. I don't want banger, I want gold. The gold includes all the bangers because the gold imparts existence to the banger. It is because of which the gold the bang it is because of gold that the bangle exists, because of gold that the bangle shines. In gold all bangles are included. In the I, everything is included. I am all-inclusive, boundless, complete, whole. Then what else? Who is anybody else? For Swamiji, I am one consciousness, I am whole and complete. You are another consciousness, whole and complete. Looks like there are as many consciousnesses, as many living beings are there. Every conscious being seems to be different from and separate from other conscious beings. So let us look at that. I am a conscious being. What is my nature? Consciousness is nature of the conscious being. What is consciousness? We just examined. Which shines and illumines everything, which frees from all the boundaries, the boundless. 
and there were attributeless, formless, attributeless, boundless, changeless. Remember the lamp in the theater. The elements of the change is itself remaining unchanging. Only the changeless can illumine the changes. The boundless can illumine the boundaries. The one can illumine many. So if I am the conscious being whose nature is consciousness, which is boundless, which is formless, which is changeless, which is attributeless. And you say that you are also the conscious being whose nature is consciousness, that is again formless, boundless, attributeless. Then please tell me, what is the dividing line between the consciousness that you are and consciousness that I am? What's the dividing line? On what basis can you say that you are separate from me? If by the word you we mean the chitihi, the consciousness, and by I also I mean the chitihi consciousness, the consciousness is no attribute at all because it is no boundary, no form. And therefore, this attributeless consciousness, in what way can it be separate from that attribute consciousness, if you want to call it that consciousness? Meaning that there is nothing that separates one consciousness from the other. Just as in this hall there are many bulbs, the light has no attribute and therefore one light cannot be separated from the other light. Like there are so many spaces, so many enclosures are there, in every enclosure seems to enclose a space and therefore there is a pot space one, pot space two, etc. How many spaces are there? As many enclosures are there. So this, this part space believes that I am separate, this one is separate. When the part space realizes that space is my nature, partness is an attribute, incidental attribute. I am not confined to the part. I am space that is formless, taintless, boundless. This one also says, I am space that is formless, boundless, all pervasive. Then, what is it that separates one part space from the other part space? Nothing. Each of them is attributeless. Yes, one part is separated from the other part, true. So also, one body, mind, sense complex is separated from the other body, mind, sense complex, quite right. Not the consciousness that I am, the consciousness that you are. Sarvatra Samadarshana. The consciousness that I am is, I see the consciousness that you are. It's the consciousness that any living being is. We are a small little worm also, the conscious being of which the nature is consciousness, understand? But Swami, how can boundless consciousness be in this little worm, in a bacteria, in a unicellular organism? Yes. Because bacteria is the description of the upadhi of a body mind sense complex, even a cell also a description of upadhi, which is a vehicle of manifestation of consciousness. Understand all conscious beings, whatever the nature is, whatever the size is, they are all nothing but the locus of manifestation of consciousness. Same consciousness, locusless consciousness. Manifest through all the apparent locuses. In a fancy way they say it's a circle without a center and stuff like that. That kind of expression that are used. Or in the grain of sand you have the whole universe. Because too, the same limitless consciousness informs everything. And we are talking about the living beings 
But interestingly enough, the same consciousness also exists in this table and chair, in the so-called unconscious entity, same consciousness exists. How can you say that, Swamiji? Consciousness exists in this pot, in this pen, in this table. Yes. But then this part should be conscious, is it not? It should have feelings. And when I strike like that, it should complain. If there is conscious in the table also, then should not the table be lie and can't complain? No. Here, you have to separate the consciousness from sentiency. There are objects having life, there are objects which do not have life. The sentient and insentient, what is sentient? Having life. What is insentient? Which doesn't have life. These two kinds of objects we encounter. What is it that separates one from the other? What makes one object a lifeless, insentient entity? What is it that makes the other object a live, sentient entity? Is it the presence or absence of consciousness that creates the difference? No. It is the presence or absence of subtle body that creates a difference. What is the uniqueness about me? That not only I possess a gross body, I also possess a subtle body. The consciousness manifesting through the subtle body enlivens this gross body. Therefore, this body is live. We call it a sentient being. Tables and chairs are insentient entities. They don't have a subtle body. The consciousness is there, but does not manifest as life because it is subtle body that becomes the medium for the consciousness to manifest as life. For example, it is a tungsten bulb that is a medium because of which the electricity manifests as light. And same electricity can pass through a rod and may not manifest as light because the rod doesn't have the tungsten filament. Similarly also, entities that possess subtle bodies what is a subtle body consisting of the mind, intellect, sense organs Subtle body. So you and I have a gross body which is evident to senses, and within that is a subtle body that enlivens this gross body. Consciousness is equally present everywhere. But consciousness, when there is subtle body, the subtle body makes the consciousness manifest as life and when the subtle body is not there, there is nothing to manifest the consciousness as life. Therefore, one is a live, alive object, other is a lifeless object. The difference is created by the presence or absence of the subtle body, not the presence or absence of consciousness. Although, when you use the word consciousness, we always equate that with life or sentience. That I am a conscious being, the table is not a conscious being. True. But then, you are conscious because there is a subtle body in you, table doesn't, but the consciousness pervades everything equally. Again, same, same text that we talked about, that Drukdasya Viveka has a verse 
which says and that you must have heard from me in million times anyway because in my talk that verse has to come generally asti bhati priyam rupam naam chetam shavanchakam an object such as the pot has five aspects asti bhati priyam asti the pot is bhati the pot shines in my consciousness priyam the pot is dear to me because it is useful to me name the this object is a name called pot and rupa is the form corresponding to the name this an object such as a pot has five aspects it is it shines it is dear asti bhati priyam and a name and a form you take another object such as a pen pen is it shines is dear to me it is mine it serves my purpose it is a name and a form so this applies to every object in the universe good bad and different everything has its five aspects because a thing is you can only say that the part is when you become aware of the part do i have a part in my hand yes because you are aware of that is there a part in my hand no because i am not aware of that meaning that exists in the part can be established only when we are aware of that and you can be aware only when it exists so existence is awareness awareness is existence the third thing that priyam is a little difficult to understand this i understand swami that part a is and part shine asti bhati i understand priyam you say it is dear i don't think it is dear i don't care for it it is true you may may, may not but a situation can arise when this part can become valuable to a situation can arise when this part can become valuable to very valuable the most valuable when you are very thirsty and you, then you want to drink some water and there is this maybe a lake there when you find this part becomes very important to you you can go to the lake and get some water in the pot meaning that any object such as rock on the road side also can become very valuable thing when there is puncture in my car i need something to use you know <coughs> to hold the car in one in one location i bring the rock put under the wheel so that it will not move this anything in the universe has a potential are becoming very valuable given the right conditions at that time the rock is very dear to me and at that time at given time something can become very dear to me when it is useful to me valuable to me makes me happy helps me so everything in the universe has a potential given the right place right time right condition anything and everything can become valuable to me useful to me favorable to me dear to me so the part is asti part shines bhati and part is dear except that the dear aspect because manifest when the right condition takes place but as i said everything has a potential of becoming valuable to me become dear to me becoming an object of happiness to me anything can give me happiness when the right time and condition is created
Meaning that, right now, I don't care for this object. doesn't make me happy. It is not because it doesn't have happiness, content of happiness. It is because my mind is not ready to contact that happiness there. The mind can contact the asti existence. The mind can contact the bhati. But for my mind to contact the priyam, the happiness that this contains, it is not that this object has to undergo a change, my mind has to undergo a change. Panchadashi explains, what is it that keeps us deprived of the experience of happiness? It is the raga and the dvesha. My mind is just not at peace because of attachment and aversion, the impurity of the mind makes the mind disturbed, agitated, unsteady. When the mind becomes free from raga, dvesha, all impurities, becomes pure and transparent, then experience that cheerfulness, happiness, then any object can make me happy. Sometimes when you take a walk in nature, anything that makes you happy, a flower makes you happy, even a rock makes you happy, anything makes you happy, because you are happy. Swasti, bhati, priyam, nama and rupa. So what separates one object from the other is nama and the rupa. What separates this object from a clock? It is one name and form. The clock is a different name and form. Asti, bhati, priyam is the universal content. Because everything exists, because asti is there. Because something shines, because bhati is there. Something is useful or dear, because the priyam is there. Nothing is devoid of asti, bhati, priyam. Sentient or insentient, understand? It's a table or a chair or a pot or a pen or anything. Nothing is devoid of asti, bhati, priyam. Asti, bhati is evident in all circumstances. Priyam becomes evident when I am ready to contact that, to experience that. The Rasti Bhati Priyam alone is called consciousness, Bhati is consciousness. So when you use the word consciousness, we always somehow confuse it with a sentient being. But consciousness is a principle that illumines everything, that shines by itself and illumines everything. That's called consciousness. Then this part is eliminated, that's the reason why I become conscious of the path. I become conscious of something because that is limited by consciousness. But consciousness, asti, bhati, priya means consciousness. And that equally informs any name and form, good, bad or indifferent, whatever the name and form is. Ishavasam, idam suram, yat kincha, jagatyam, jagat. The Jagat in the universe, whatever that is, is to be seen or pervaded by Ishvara, by Brahman, by Asti, Bhati, Priyam, by Satchidananda, which we call existence sometimes, we call consciousness sometimes, we call Ananda sometimes, Satyam, Jnanam, Anandam. Satyam is Jnanam, Jnanam is Anandam. Asti is bhati and bhati is priyam. They are not separate. We use three words, but they have the same meaning. Therefore, it is all pervasive. Nothing is excluded. It is all inclusive, all pervasive. That is what I am and that is what you are. That is what this part also is. What is the nature of part? Asti, Bhati, Priyam, Nama, Rupa, is it not so? Adhyatram, Brahma Rupam, Jagad Rupam, Tatodvayam. First three, Asti, Bhati, Priyam, is Brahman, 
ये सत्यम ज्ञान अनंतम ब्रह्म ये सच्चिदानंद आत्मा जगदुरुकुम तथो द्वयम द लास्ट टू द नेम इन फॉर्म इज व्हाट वी कॉल जगत इज व्हाट वी कॉल क्रिएशन यू रिमेंबर वी डिस्क्राइब द क्रिएशन व्हाट इज सत asti bhati priyam brahman consciousness eva the same nirdosham untainted and affected one without a second that as though created this five element whole universe it manifests as a whole universe without undergoing any change at all therefore what is universe what is this part name and form manifestation of asti bhati priyam so what is the name and form is the vehicle of manifestation of asti bhati priyam so who am i asti bhati priyam manifesting through this name and form who are you asti bhati priyam manifesting through that name and form what's his part asti bhati priyam possessing this name and form we said when earlier is not that i am a body possessing consciousness i am a name and form possessing consciousness i am consciousness possessing name and form again let me point out an important aspect we told you talked about we say that this part is five aspects asti bhati priyam name form when we say five we take for granted that all the five has the same degree of reality but it's not so that also lumping is lumping is going on here the asti bhati priyam enjoys one degree of reality and naam rupa enjoys another degree of reality the same in my case the drashta enjoys one degree of reality the drushya the purusha the stree tall enjoys another degree of reality even though i say i am happy looks like i and happiness i am and happiness are the same degree of reality no the i am enjoys one degree of reality the subject the consciousness the happy and happy enjoys a different degree of reality its object illumined similarly in this object also even though we say it has five aspects jasti bhati priyam rupa nama but these five have do not have the same degree of reality of that asti bhati priyam has one degree of reality and nama and rupa has another degree of reality that's the reason why we trace the whole process of creation to explain the life as we are experiencing now we are experiencing life like this that we are experiencing the path and take for granted that the name and form that the path has have the same degree of reality as the existence of the part of the part is so we think that part and isness enjoy the same degree of reality no that is that shines asti bhati prem is a one degree of reality which is the same in all the names and forms without exception and name and form is what we explain that creation is what a projection mithya so mithya becomes a vehicle for the manifestation of satyam yasti bhati priyam the self the consciousness brahman is satyam and name and form is what mithya merely the medium of manifestation it is true that one object is seemingly different from another object 
A part, a ghata, is different from a cloth, pata. The ghata and pata appear to be different from each other. And what separates the two is name and form. But understand that. What is ghata? Asti, bhati, priyam. Manifested through one name and form. What is pata, the cloth? Asti, bhati, priyam. Manifesting the same, um, manifesting to this name and form. Therefore, at one level the objects are different from each other, you can say that. But the fundamental level, every object is nothing but asti bhadi priyam. Because if we examine what this spot is, we carry out a Vedantic investigation of what this spot is. In many ways you can do that. The simple way you can say that this spot is nothing but various molecules. An assembly of variety of molecules. Each molecule is an assembly of various atoms. Each atom is an assembly of various subatomic particles. Each subatomic particle is an assembly of yet further sub-subatomic particles. And thus, if you want, if you make an inquiry in that manner, to understand what this thought really is, you find that at every level, it becomes subtler, subtler and subtler. The part is gross and tangible. The molecules are not gross and tangible. Atoms are less tangible, subatomic particles less tangible. And thus, as we proceed in investigation as to what the need, real nature of this is, it becomes less tangible, less tangible, less tangible. How far can that process go on? The scientists, in fact, subdivide and subdivide, and for that they use very sophisticated instrument or equipment. But we can carry out that whole thinking in our mind. That every assembly is made up of the various components and every component is another assembly made of its components and like that it goes on and on. Where should ultimately go to a component which is not an assembly? Every effect it reduces to cause. Cause is another effect, it reduces its own cause. It should lead to what point? To a cause which is not an effect. A particle which is not an assembly. Particle means an entity which is not an assembly. So these names and forms of tangibility when we really analyze what this all tangibility disappears, because understand that it has been superimposed to begin with. And therefore, when you analyze what this object is, you remember reversing the process of creation? The creation was described there from Asti, Bhati, Priyam, Satchitananda to all the names and forms. When you reverse that process, this turns out to be nothing but asti bhati priyam. The name and form is no tangibility. To give you a simple example of a pot itself, what is this pot? Nothing but clay. Because the name and form is subject to changing. Pot breaks, it's the different name and form. That breaks, a different name and form. And that process can be carried on how far until name and form disappears. But the content should remain. Understand that the content cannot be void. Content cannot be non-existent. Existence is the content. Because otherwise this cannot exist. So the Vedantin explains that every name and form 
ultimately reduces to simple existence. Asti, which is the same as Bhati, which is the same as Priyam, which is same as Ananda, Satchit Ananda. So what is, in case of all the parts, what is is clay. Here also, what is is Asti Bhati Priyam, Satchit Ananda. Is not out there. It is my very nature. It is I. I am the whole universe. There is none like me. There is none other me. All there is is my only I, the self. Sarabhuta Samatmanam, Sarabhuta Anichatmani, Ikshade Yoga Yukta Atma, Sarvatra Samadarshanaha. Lord Krishna says, Sarabhuta Samatmanam. The yogi who appreciates the Atma, the consciousness, the Asti Bhadi Priyam, the Self in all Bhuta, in all names and forms. Sarabhuta Anicha Atmani and all names and forms deriving its existence from the Self. For example, this part. When this part recognizes that I am clay, when the part's own perception of itself undergoes the transformation. The part recognizes I am clay. Before creation I was clay. While creation I am clay. After dissolution I am clay. The name and form is incidental. The clay is essential. Then this part also is essentially clay. Self that I am, the self that I am the self of all. Then what is his name and form? The clay is in the name and form, clay is the self of name and form. The clay sustains the name and form. The name and form exists in clay. Name and form is in clay. It derives existence from clay. So you can say that the clay is the self of all the parts, all the names and forms, and names and forms are all dependent upon the self, superimposed upon the self, in the self. Therefore what is, is clay, because the name and form is not a separate entity, is not counted as second, all there is is one non-dual. Sarvatra Samadarsana. So Lord Krishna gives this equation. Sarabhuta Samatmanam, Sarabhuta Anichatmani. Just a small little nose ring recognizes that I am gold and all, I am the self of all the ornaments. And all the ornaments are in me, in the gold. All names and forms are in the gold, superimposed upon the gold. Nothing but gold. This is the knowledge of the non-dual. In spite of duality, because duality doesn't, the name and form doesn't create duality. When we recognize it's, it's its reality, there's just incident and appearance. Essentially what is, is asti bhadi priyam. That's you, that's I, that's this part, that's table, chair, everywhere, self of all. Sarvatra samadarsana. The yogi is the one who sees sama, same asti bhati priyam, as the self of all, and my own self, I am the self of all. I am in everything, and everything is in me. Sarabhuta samatmanam, sarabhuta anichatmani, ikshate yoga yukta atma. Who sees this? Yoga yukta atma. One who is endowed with yoga, with this knowledge. One who has carried out this inquiry. And one for whom this has become the reality. You keep on doing this again and again. The text Durgdusha Viveka says, Upekshana Rupedve Satchidananda Tatparaha. From now on, 
May you carry on this contemplation all the time with reference to yourself as well as with reference to what is out there. Upekshanam rupedve that the name and form is incidental. What this really is, is what? Asti Bhati Priyam. Satchitananda manifesting through this name and form. Satchitananda manifesting through this name and form. And therefore, it is a costume. Name and form is a costume. Because of identification, the costume, the Asti Bhati Priyam appears to be limited, insignificant, and therefore it is injured all the time. When costume is recognized as costume, name and form is just a costume. The reality is asti bhati priyam. Upekshana rupeta. That all along. Whenever you see anything, experience anything, contemplate, remain, remain, uh, you know, contemplate. The name and form are incidental. Satchidananda tatpara. What is this asti bhati priyam? What is this Satchidananda? Whether it's Kham, Vayu, Vagnihi, Apaha, Prasvi, all the five elements are there. Deva Tiring, Naradishu, whether all kinds of the living beings are there. Abhinna, Satchidananda, Bhindyate, Rupanamani. What separates from some of the other? What creates the appearance of separatedness is Nama Rupa. Abhinna, Satchidananda, Satchidananda, Asti Bhadavi, Abhinna. One non-dual. So the, the author of the text urges that may you be indifferent to name and form. Meaning may the name and form not matter to you. That what matters to you is asti bhadi priyam. But that's a content. That's a reality. Name and form is just a costume, incidental. Upeksha. When you see a beggar on the stage, upeksha, up, the, be indifferent to the costume and appreciate the actor. You will also be indifferent to the name and form. Let's go vairagya. When name and form doesn't matter what it is, where it is, does not matter to me. That is when I have no attachment, no aversion for that. Just as we do that with the things outside, so, so we do it with our own self also. In myself also, what is important is asti bhati priyam. This name and form is incidental. Swami so and so is incidental. I'm wealthy, incidental. I'm powerful, incidental. I'm famous, incidental. I'm nobody, incidental. I'm insignificant, incidental. All of these are designations or attributes of name and form. What does it matter whether I am significant or insignificant? Whether I am wealthy or poor, what does it matter? It all belongs to name and form, to the costume. <coughs> Upeksha, be indifferent to that. Meaning that, let, gladly accept it. Then only I can appreciate what is significant, what is real. Is that asti bhati prem is my real nature, your real nature, real nature, everything that there is. What is asti bhati prem? What is this Brahman? And that Brahman I am. With this vision, sarvatra samadarshana, the yogi, the wise man, sees samam asti bhati prem, satchit anandam, Brahma. Everywhere, in all beings, all in all beings, and all beings in it, one non-dual Brahman. That's all there is. That's what I am. Swami, suppose you know this. So what happens? This knowledge enables me to become free from all my sense of lack and want. As long as I keep on judging myself based on this name and form, I'm always insignificant. And I'm not satisfied with my, I keep on injuring myself, rejecting myself, insulting myself. 
But when I have the right perception of myself, then I stop injuring. Nahi nasti atmana atmanam tato yati param gatim Lord Krishna says. Samam pashani sarvatra samavasthitam ishwaram. Seeing the samam, seeing the astibhati, priyam ni ananda existing everywhere as one's own self. From then on, he does not injure himself by himself. You know, Brahms himself is insignificant. There's no question of self-dissatisfaction, self-unhappiness, self-rejection, self-condemnation. All that process stops. The self-injuring process stops. I own up my true self and I find myself Totally satisfied with myself. Tato yadi param gatim. By virtue of this knowledge, Lord Krishna says, What is the result of this knowledge? Tato yadi param gatim. When it is param gatim, the supreme goal, the supreme end, Tad Vishnu ho param padam, the ultimate goal that is called Vishnu, or that is called the limitlessness, happiness or moksha of the liberation, this vision of myself, this vision of the reality makes me free from all bondage which was only created. Imagine, superimposed, which was a brahma or a delusion. That sense of smallness, lack, want, insignificant, insignificance was just a delusion of brahma. All that happens is brahma nivrutti the cessation of that Brahma, superimposition, illusion. And what is is myself. And I realize that that's what I am, complete, whole, non-dual, all-inclusive. Then there's the total self-acceptance. Atmaneva, Atmanatushtha. One who is satisfied by himself, by himself. Tato yadi param gatim. By virtue of this knowledge, one attains param gatim. The most exalted goal, most exalted end, which is one's own self. Gati means a goal, or gati means the travel. There is no travel involved here. There is no goal involved here. It's a travel from ignorance to knowledge, from the self to the self. Sarvatra Samadarshana, this yogi who has this knowledge, attains the ultimate goal of the life of wholeness, completeness, non-duality. That's how he gains a complete satisfaction with himself, with everything. He gets established in ananda, the wholeness, happiness, the limitless happiness. That's the goal that Vedanta presents to be achieved in this lifetime. It's called Jivan Mukti. One becomes liberated even while alive. Meaning that the existence of the body is not an obstacle to this knowledge or to the freedom. The body doesn't create bondage. It is a identification of the body that creates a sense of bondage. Bondage is not created, it's just a sense. And when I stop measuring myself through this costume, when I see myself as I am, then all that false notions go away and I discover myself. I was always free. I don't become free. The wise man does not say I became free. He says, I realize that I was always free. Jivan Mukta, liberated while Alive. That's the goal. That's what this yogi attains by samadarshana, by the darshana, the vision of sameness everywhere. Om. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate 
ಪೂರ್ಣಸ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಶಂಕರ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಕೇಶವಂಬಾದರಾಯಣ ಸೂತ್ರಭಾಷ್ಯಕೃತ ವಂದೇ ಭಗವಂತ ಪುನಃ ಪುನಃ ಈಶ್ವರೋ ಗುರುರಾತ್ಮೇತಿ ಮೂರ್ತಿ ಭೇದ ವಿಭಾಗಿನೆ ವ್ಯೋಮವ್ಯಾಪ್ತೇಹಾಯ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ma 
मानस भज रे गुरु चरणम श्री गुरु चरणम प्रणमाम्य हम सदगुरु चरणम प्रणमाम्य हम निर्मल हृदय विराजित चरणम सर्वचराचर व्यापक चरणम भव सागर उद्धारक चरणम श्री गुरु चरणम प्रणमाम्य हम सदगुरु चरणम प्रणमाम्य हम मानस भज रे गुरु चरणम श्री गुरु चरणम प्रणमाम्य हम सदगुरु चरणम प्रणमाम्य हम श्री गुरु चरणम प्रणमाम्य हम सदगुरु चरण 